And I, I honestly, lately, that's been a bigger thing for me. Wow. Yeah. Because the younger prophet would have said to the older prophet, take a risk. The younger prophet would have said, nothing's impossible. Because the older prophet has seen many disappointments that the younger prophet didn't see. Wow. The older prophet, the younger prophet didn't know that he could die. The older prophet right. has seen many die around me. The younger prophet had nothing to lose because he had no money, no notoriety, and no reputation. And the younger prophet would say to the older prophet, why not go back to the days when you were willing to risk it all? everybody, welcome to Cultural Catalyst, where we help you to learn how to live fully alive, co-labor with God, and change the world. And today I have some friends. First of all, I don't know if you knew I had friends, but I am not paying these people to be on. So I just want to make that really clear. Hey, this is Haley Braun. Say hi, Haley. What up? What's up right there? And Bethany and Dano McCollum. And we are uh, hey here. You guys? Yeah, you guys, please step it up. <laughs> We're here to talk new, about the School idea. of the Prophets, which is coming up in August 7th through the 11th or something yeah. like that, right? Hey, I got, listen, I got that right. 7th through the 11th of August. And we are part of the the team of the School of the Prophets. I think Dan and I have been doing it since the first coming, second coming, <laughs> second coming. We're waiting for the second coming. So and what we, we want to just talk about uh, prophets and you know, uh, just kind of demystifying the call of a prophet. You know, it's funny to me, we are having this conversation a while back, but people are, will say things like, oh, I, I don't believe in titles, and, and then they'll call their leader Pastor John or Pastor Mary or a teacher so-and-so, evangelist so-and-so. So, you know, uh, you know I, I think, first of all, just getting into the fact that we, do, we don't call each other prophet or apostle or we don't each, each call each other evangelist, pastor, or teacher, really, in our environment. But I think that the titles, Jesus said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. So I do think that understanding the call, the office call that is interacting with the body of Christ is important from the standpoint of understanding the kind of anointing that's flowing, gift that's that's coming from that, that individual or even that team. So um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what, before you uh, understood that you guys were prophets, you know, what, what was your understanding of the prophetic ministry? Like how, how is your, how, how has your understanding, the evolution of your understanding changed over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, maybe for yourself personally, and also for the body of Christ. And anyone can jump in on this and kind of answer this <laughs> well, oh, go ahead bethany you usually first yeah, yeah. Well, i think you should tell I'm your story first. about that well word. i was going to talk about yeah. that in a minute but um chris i grew up and i grew up in a church that that embraced the prophetic but the prophetic looked like back in the 80s it often looked like the traveling prophets that would come into town, you know, so you kind of have the presbytery once a year or something like that. It's the pool of Bethesda where right. the angel your come name down and picked? stir the water and one the first person that got in and get healed. That's it was so like pool of Bethesda prophecy. The finger would come out and call one person out of the audience. And- <laughs> exactly. Or it'd be like maybe in the context of worship, you know, there'd be a spontaneous moment and all of a sudden you'd hear somebody from the back row of the church be like, thus saith the Lord. And then there'd be like this kind of popcorn 
prophecy, but honestly, I, I, yeah, they were often. That's when Pro, often, Prozac sold really good in those days to Christians. <laughs> Man, I can tell you something. Anti-anxiety medication was really big in those days. That's so funny. But for me growing (laughs) up, I thought, to be honest, I believed in the prophetic, but I thought the prophetic was only for prophets or for special leaders within the church. It was an elite kind of thing. It it was unintentionally so, but it definitely, the accessibility of the voice of God for every believer was not really taught or promoted. And so even though I grew up with the value for the prophetic and even for prophets, um, I didn't really see how that related to me unless I got a word, you know? And so really understanding that dynamic or that shift, that was kind of my understanding of that, yeah. What about you guys? But one of the shifts for you personally, okay, tell that so story. Okay, so wants me to tell. I, I, I do. I have the story. So the biggest shift for me happened where I was also a worship, uh, I was a worship pastor, worship leader for about 20 years. And about 15 years ago, I was on this little side of a mountain, you know, church, a small little church on the side of a, a mountain resort, kind of like David you know, when he was with his sheep or whatever, (laughs) that was my time period. That was, I put my time in there and um, a prophet came into town and he told me something that shifted my life. And he said, Bethany, you're not a worship leader that prophesies. You're a prophet who leads worship. And that, that moment was very catalytic for me because it shifted this identity in me as a prophet where I no longer was as a worship leader looking for the word of the Lord, looking for the breakthrough, whether is it in the song, is it going to be in this moment, in this moment, as a prophet who leads worship, I realized I was the very conduit through which the prophetic grace was released. It didn't matter what song I would sing because God's prophetic grace would be released if I strummed my guitar, but I Prophetic grace was shifted. The breakthrough was shifted. And so realizing I wasn't just looking for the breakthrough, I was the breakthrough. And that was the biggest shift for me in transitioning to that revelation as a prophet. What about, what about you guys? Haley, why don't you go? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a conservative church, so we didn't, I wasn't taught on the prophetic. I wasn't taught about prophets, um, but was always, I mean, the grace the grace and the functions there, whether you know it or not. So um, I look back at my life and I see the grace and the function from really small. I remember when I was three years old watching a guy at a barn dance and I just knew he needed to hear he was doing a great job. A, a barn a dance? A barn dance, yeah. They were doing heel and toe, heel and toe. Yeah. Barn yeah. dance, yeah. Barn yeah. dance. Uh, you know, they you know, they're dosey doing and left hand clap and right hand clap and that. Yeah, and uh, we were at a Christian camp and they were doing this, you know, social event and I'm I was three and I never forget looking at this man and thinking he needs to hear he's doing a good job. I I don't know any more than that other than I remember sharing that with him and a few days later overhearing him talk to my parents and be like, that is your daughter? And they're like, yeah, that's my daughter. And he was like, I was having the worst day of my life. I was feeling so depressed, so down. I said, God, I just need to know that you see me. And he said, I thought she was an angel. I didn't even think she was real. And um, these w- random occurrences, this would happen to me throughout my life as a teenager. I would know things about my friends, I, you know, and I just didn't. And I even remember once rebuked the church at 19, conservative church rebuked them for lacking passion in worship. And uh, my young adults leader uh, had a meeting with me and I basically told him, well, people didn't like Elijah or Ezekiel, so why would they like me? Because I just had no prophetic etiquette or protocol. I didn't, I just would have these moments where it was almost like the Lord had put me on like a glove. And so uh, coming to School of Ministry at Bethel in 2008 was, I remember walking into the sanctuary on a Friday night, the first time I've ever been in Reading at Bethel. And it was like, I can't explain to me, it was like a glass ceiling broke off over my head. And I looked over my friend and I said, I make sense. No one had preached. The, the worship hadn't started. It was like walking into an atmosphere. And I hope we get to talk about a little bit about a prophetic culture, but walking into not just a prophetic principle, but a prophetic culture where a prophet was here and his grace was available for us to, and it was celebrated. It was something that broke open in my life from what you guys had stewarded. And um, yeah, I'm I'm watching it now in my son. This this blossoming of a prophetic gift and anointing without any pressure or weirdness. It's 
it's amazing. So that was my introduction to the prophetic. And the last thing I'll say is uh, it really shifted when I found out I was a prophet. When you called me out, it shifted how I pastored. I began to realize, yeah. well, prophets are there to equip the saints to connect to the voice and the heart of God. And it, it really did shift my posturing. And um, I do think that knowing you're a prophet shifts how you how you behave and how you carry yourself in the call that uh, or the vocation that you're in. Totally. How about you, Dana? Um, I, I love I love what you shared, Haley, because I think um, it captures some real values of the school of the prophets. And that is, first of all, you said you came into an atmosphere where suddenly you felt normal, where you fit, where you were in a tribe of people that were going after the same thing. And that's one of the reasons we do school of the prophets is so many prophetic people don't feel like they fit or don't know how to fit within culture. And uh, so um, just finding that place of connection and belonging is a big part of, of what we do at School of the Prophets. Yeah, I think it's so dangerous actually when prophetic people, I think there's many seasons in my life where I just felt unusual. And sometimes we can, uh, pr prophetic people can feel other than and they can kind of separate themselves outside of community. But actually, we're not healthy outside of community and prophetic people need that to to really actually come into the fullness of the call. You, you see a lot in old covenant prophets, they found themselves in caves or lying on their side naked for months or just a lot of weird things. And I think um, that isolation, uh, the Lord really calls us to be part of a New Testament community family where the spirit is poured out and we are functioning as a body. And I, I think that's one thing that School of Prophets is so needed for because you don't feel so weird you actually feel like oh i have a purpose and a function and i fit somewhere yeah i think too fitting with the other parts of the body and right now i'm talking about the other fivefold ministers is so important i think that sometimes prophets hang around prophets and and even that can create in my mind an imbalanced approach to the kingdom. So true. And I think it's really important that we as a team, we as uh, prophetic people, that we have teachers in our life, that we have evangelists in our life, that we have, uh, you know, apostles in our life, and that we have, uh, that we have pastors in our life. Yeah. So important. And I was thinking about, uh, Dan Fairley is probably our house teacher. He, uh, we have several in our house, but he would be our senior house, you know, actually fivefold teacher theologian, teacher, and uh, we find ourselves in, on opposite sides of m so many situations. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of the tension is so important to me, for me. And, um, and also, you know, uh, I think processing our prophetic sense with the other fivefold ministers is really important. Yeah. The, uh, you know, how, how the evangelist is applying the prophetic word and the prophetic insights that we're getting, how the pastors want to apply it to our congregation and how they, it's, in other words, it's not just what you have, but kind of the tone and, and, and mood in which you deliver it and the timing of the delivery. All those things are so important. So I think that I'm, I'm kind of, Keying off what you were saying, Haley, yeah. about the isolation thing is so unhealthy. I, I, we do need other prophets, but we also need the rest of the body of Christ to actually yes. bring wholeness and health to us. And I do think it's frustrating to be on a team if you're the only prophet or the only high prophetic person on the team that isn't. But I'd rather have I'd rather have that than be in isolation by myself, and not have that tension of, well, you guys can't see that you guys don't get that. I mean, is that not obvious what's going on here? And I think that's probably the challenge I I had in the early days, is not 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 understanding that other people didn't understand, yeah, and not 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 understanding that people didn't see what seemed so obvious to me. It's really good, Chris. Uh, they didn't hear what seemed so easy to hear to me. And then on the, I'll say, on the watch watchman side of it, that they couldn't see that that was a wolf right there uh, and that that was leading to something really destructive. And uh, oftentimes uh, I was uh, in the early days surrounded by pastors. So 
you know, their need to, um, well, I, I don't know if they're, I, I don't know exactly how to pose this the right way, but their, their need to be diplomatic and to be non-confrontive in the, in the face of what feels like warning, warning, warning yeah. was really difficult for me. And yet I mm-hmm. think very needed on my side to understand that there are still ways to deal with the spirit world and the people who have gotten underneath that uh, demonic flow that's constructive and redemptive and reconciling as opposed to um, damning you yeah. know, or, or mm-hmm. you know, rejecting. You know, I remember when I uh, stepped onto management at BSSM, so I was stepping up a level in leadership from being a pastor of our students to now helping lead our team. And I remember Gabe Valenzuela, who's a five-fold pastor, um, I came to him with a concern about something. And he said to me, he said, he said, I just need you to know something. I'm a five-fold pastor and you're a five-fold prophet, which means you're going to build trust with me on how you hear God. He said, you have a measure of trust with me, which means you come, you share. He goes, but you're going to be frustrated at times because I'm going to move slower on some things that you want me to move fast on. And he goes, and there's going to be times where I look back back and go, I should have listened to Haley. But he said, that's going to build credibility with us. And eventually, as we build trust together, um, I'm going to start, your words are going to start carrying more weight. And he basically just communicated with me like, hey, sometimes you're going to get frustrated. I need you to, I need you to build trust more than just get all the words right and be in this atmosphere of spirituality. And I think sometimes as, as prophets, we can think that no one understands us and we can feel that frustration. But actually, to the degree that we build trust is often to the degree that we will be able to mm-hmm. release and bring shift to culture. And um, that was a really helpful and frustrating season of my life. But it built a muscle in me that I think I needed to become a, a healthier leader and prophetic voice. I'm going to impress you with this word I learned from Dano. <laughs> like 10 years ago, anachronistic. <laughs> Prophets who live anachronistically. So, Dano, talk about that because that was a great principle that I think that uh, people that are, are watching this, I, th- I think, could learn from that. Sure. I, I, this is something that I struggled with a lot. Uh, anachronistic is anything out of its proper time or out of its proper sequence. And And so it would be like watching a old Western movie and suddenly a jet flies through the background. You know, that would be an anachronism or an anachronism. And um, in the same way, prophetic people often don't realize that they're seeing things out of time. They're seeing things in advance, but what they see so often is more realistic or more compelling than their physical reality. And so it's easy to get frustrated with your present or with the pace of your leadership because you're seeing this desirable future more real than you're seeing your current reality. And what I had to learn in that, Chris, was how to turn my seer ability, my perceiver and hearer and sensor ability onto my now. Find out what's good about now and then Uh, but while still keeping my eyes on what's better about the future and then help create the process and the pathways to lead us from a good now to a better tomorrow. Ooh, that is powerful. Bethany, um, I want to pose this question to you first. Today, the cultural climate is, I I mean, moving towards toxic in some areas, right? Right, And, right? And so in the Old Testament, Oftentimes, the prophets had a huge role in the shifting of cultures, whether it was, you know, uh, the culture that was uh, sexualized in perversion or whether it was idols or whether it was just the hearts of people turned away from God. How do you see, how do you see prophets today being relevant to the current, um, yeah, culture and, and in, some, in some ways uh, crisis? Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think it's an important question today too, Chris, because frankly, we still see a lot of I'm just going to say it like this: an old an old covenant mixture or mindset in New Testament prophets, and understanding that 
all of the, like we can certainly learn from their process, but the, the purpose of the old covenant often was to obviously represent the voice of God, the heart of God to a people group, to a person, but it's all pointing to Jesus, right? And so now that we're in this new Testament, you know, this new Testament time, we now have prophets that are, that are for the equipping of the body that are equipping of the saints. And so as new covenant prophets, we are no longer called to prophesy judgment, to prophesy, you know, destruction or anything like that. That is, that is no longer legal because of what Jesus did. That literally tramples the blood of Jesus Christ and what he came to do. And so as new covenant prophets, how do we now look at what's happening at the cultural through the lens of what Jesus came and accomplished and also what he still wants to do? And I think that's the component here that I'd like to see as a prophet is no longer, and you know, we've all been talking about this within our group, of course, that we don't want to just be protesters you know, we often say it doesn't take a prophet to see what's wrong, right? But a prophet is going to see the treasure or the hope or what it is that Jesus already has provided for to declare that and to call that forth into being. You know, we know that people, I believe one of the, 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 the key functions of a prophet is to help people see what you see right? So our role is to see what Jesus is seeing or saying. And if, as we declare, as we model, as we even create a structure, we're giving people vision to see not only what Jesus has seen, but they're able to see something that they hadn't, no mind is conceived, no ear is heard or even imagined, right? So even by presenting the possibility, now they're starting to work towards heavenly solutions rather than just complaining about the problem, right? And so I, I believe that prophets are catalytic for bringing forth what is on Jesus's heart to address these solutions that frankly are not new. I mean, they're not, they're not new problems, right guys? Like we just saw, I know Dan and Regina just saw the movie Sound of Freedom. I took my daughter last night, which of course is about human trafficking. And I was just sitting there thinking like, you would think with the technological era we're in and how upgraded our society would seem to be that slavery would no longer be an issue. Totally. And, and this is this is literally, we are still dealing with slavery that is literally thousands of years old. The movie that said there are more slaves, slaves now, now on the earth than any time in history. Exactly. Any time in history now. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we have to understand that these issues we're dealing with, they're not just cultural. They are... They're issues of the heart. They're issues of the oh, fallen man. man. Yeah. But God has a heavenly solution for where we are right now. And I believe that's what prophets in our New Testament day are called to bring. Yeah, Dan, do you have any any insight into that also? Like how do we become relevant to culture uh, and not create a kind of uh, training and equipping that's really just relevant to Christians who are charismatic, basically, and usually in the four walls of the church, which was my first 20 years of prophetic ministry. Chris, I love a metaphor you've used uh, for many years in the School of the Prophets. You've said, uh, we often train people in the zoo and then send them in the jungle and wonder why it doesn't work. And um, so I think that's part of it is like yeah. we, we need to train with the end in mind. Um, that the, the training should not just be what works in church. I think one of the greatest areas of pioneering in the prophetic is in the area of protocols. And protocols are made up of three things. They're the language, the purpose, and the procedure for any environment. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we need to do is we need to be pioneering protocols for every sphere yeah. of society, for every area of culture of how, how does the prophetic match this procedure? Um, how does the prophetic go after these purposes and these goals? And what is the language that's appropriate to that culture? And um, you have also, you know, helped us to realize that we're not we're not compromising, but we are customizing. In Ephesians 4, it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful, which benefits the listener. Mm -hmm. And I think 
a new covenant prophet has to be concerned about their listener. They have to be concerned about heaven's heart for that person and for their problem and for their procedure. You know, one of the reasons that we've not been able to reach our own Native American culture or ethnic culture here in the States is because we haven't come through their procedural doorway. Mm -hmm. In other words, we violate our way into their presence and then expect to be heard and um, we're not following a culture of honor. We're, we're not coming through the gate. We are jumping the fence and sneaking through the back door and wondering why we appear like a wolf or a thief. And so as prophets, I think there's been a sensitivity to heaven and a lack of sensitivity to earth. We've caught the word of the Lord, but not the heart of the Lord. We've caught um, what God is saying and doing, but we haven't caught his redemptive purpose within what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And we've thought only in terms of church and not in terms of kingdom. And I think those things have held us back from that kind of cultural revelant, rev, uh, revelance or uh, relevance, relevance yeah. or integration, really. It's also about like, why is there such a boundary between modern culture and the prophetic and the church? Part of it is the lack, the lack of, of protocol. protocol. Yeah. We have a lot of, you know, social media prophets, you know, it's, it's kind of scary. It's really scary. scary. (laughs) And, you know, you can, you can, you can create, you can be a great marketing person um, and extend your reach pretty far, right? You can, you can substitute marketing for favor and have you know hundreds of thousands of people on your social pages listening to you, not because you have great favor, but because you understand Instagram or TikTok or you know some social pages and and how to you know manipulate the algorithms, and you can be pretty much completely out of compliance and out of accountability and out of protocol, and uh, and and be influencing a lot of people. And so, you know, I think it's really important that we do build prophetic communities where there is accountability, there is training and equipping. Yeah. There's, you know, there's also grace and mercy for people uh, on our own, in our own communities that are struggling and that are going through really hard things. What does it look like? I'll start with you, Haley. What does it look like to be a mature prophet? Like, let, let's, let's do some contrast. I, I think it's great to contrast a little bit. Like, how would you see, like, what does immaturity look like? Not, yeah. not sin, because we, we could talk about, you know, not sinning. But what does the, what's the difference between an immature prophet and a mature prophet? What are we expecting from people? Because, you know, I don't expect the same thing from my 13-year-old grandson yeah. as I do my, my 42-year-old son. So the, when we talk about immaturity... We're not, we're not necessarily talking about people doing something wrong. We're talking about the opportunity to, to have the process of growing up as you grow older. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure there will be a lot of things said. I think there's a couple of things that come to mind. The first one, Dana was talking about, you know, procedure and protocol. And I was just thinking about maturity in the prophetic is that I don't come to serve myself, but I come to serve. And I think uh, in the world system, the higher up you get, the more distant you become from people and the more you are served. And I think when Mm. uh, uh, a lot of these TikTok, social media prophets, uh, it's about building a platform and a a revenue or a it's feeding it's feeding a place in the person and it's not feeding the body and i think you know as you become a mother or a father you become a mature adult you recognize your life is you, you go to work and you come back why to feed your children to house your children that the it becomes legacy in mind i think so i think the first thing is that we seek to serve we don't use our freedom for selfish gain galatians 5:13 but to serve the world in love i think to maturity is that i I live for a legacy beyond my lifetime. 
So I'm not here to build a monument for myself, but I'm here to create a legacy with eternity in mind. I'm building for a great cloud of witnesses that were sawn into and crucified upside down who have not yet entered into the fullness of their reward apart from us. Um, and then the, the last thing I was I was thinking through in maturity um, just is that Dana was talking about the heart of God. And I think in, in 1 Samuel 2.35, it says that the Lord says, I will raise up a prophet and a priest who will do what is in my heart and in my soul. And I think mature prophets are have real intimacy with the Lord and are seeking to drive the Lord's agenda with service for the people that are in front of them. And they know what is in God's heart and they understand not just the principle, but they're carrying the the truth and the, the value that God has in their heart. And God has I- immense value for people, not just for Christians. And I think sometimes we, we come as Christians like we know instead of coming low, God so loved the world. And I think that a mature prophet understands the heart that the Lord has for building up his people and drawing them to him. So good. You guys want to speak into that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that we both probably have a lot no, to add to it. that too. Yeah. Um, I would say I love what Haley said too. I agree with the protocols and stuff. I'm just thinking about the difference. The funny thing about this question too is that you can have a really immature prophet who's really accurate prophetically, <laughs> which can be confusing for people sometimes because I think that'd be one of the first revelations is knowing that the accuracy of your gift does not determine the maturity of your office. And, and so go. realizing again that there are believers that are actually oftentimes even more accurate in their prophetic gift than even a prophet is. So understanding the the, the difference there between a prophet call and also the, the office, I mean, the call of the believer to prophesy. But I think um, in addition to the, again, the community understanding, we talked about this earlier, that it's actually more of a function than a title. Right. And so how as a prophet, am I equipping and building up the body like that is my role. That is what Jesus called the fivefold to do was to equip and to bring to maturity the saints. And so as a mature prophet, it is not about your platform, which we were just talking about that. It really is about how can I come and serve others as, as Haley was referencing to. And then I would say one, I mean, there's a lot, but I would say another thing that came to my mind was, I believe that as you grow in maturity in your prophetic or your prophet office, I think the clarity of your metron and really knowing that lane that you're specifically called to, um, I believe that, and then you stay in that lane, you know, I believe that that is a sign of coming into maturity as a prophet that I don't know, Dano had said this earlier, but I think this may have come from you, Chris, where, or maybe it was Graham Cook, where your gift works everywhere on everyone, That's Chris, but yeah. best somewhere on someone. And so really understanding that growing in your maturity as a prophet, it's not like a shotgun, you know, you're not trying to save the whole world. You got to know your lane. You got to know who that people, that place, that grace, that faces that you are uniquely called to impact to sow, to build, to equip, to strengthen. And when you do that and you stay in your lane, I believe that's where you're going to see the greatest level of acceleration, of growth. And um, I think that is a sign of maturity that that um, stepping into that. And also I'll just mention one other little thing. It's like when you just don't need the validation of men. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just, when you don't need that validation of men and you know at the end of the day that you that you are serving the heart of the Lord and what God called you to do. Obviously this is not an excuse to be the, the lone ranger, you know, or to be that Ezekiel or that, you know, to be someone, nobody loves me. That means I'm called to be a prophet. I see that stuff all the time too. And I, I just think I'm just calling that like, yes, there's times when you are called to stand on things that God has told you to, but really you should always be connected to the body. And so uh, but you're not, it's an interesting dynamic. You know, you can't let that feed you. It still has to be uh, your validation coming from the Lord and, and who he's called you to be as a prophet. Dano, you, what would you say to the younger prophet in you? The 20 years ago, prophet, like, 
you know, people ask that, well, what would you say to the, you know, 30 year younger self of you, you know, you, you know, you 30 years ago, what would you say? Like, what would you say to 20 years ago to you? Wow. wow. That's, that's, that's so, so much. much. It's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not on the list right here. Yeah. 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 Um, As a prophet. Yeah. I think, I think part of it, I wish I'd learned, um, to not only hear God myself, but to be able to hear God through others. Um, I, th I think one of the great challenges I had as a young prophet is I was asking everyone why they couldn't see what I saw, but I wasn't willing to see what they saw. So good. And um, realizing that 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, we know in part, we prophesy in part. If we know that our vision, our knowledge, our gift is a part of a bigger puzzle, then it opens our heart and our ears and our eyes to not only see what we see that the Lord is saying and doing, but to see and to hear what he's doing through uh, other members of the body. It's kind of, Chris, what you were talking about earlier, about how prophets don't just need a prophetic community where everybody's prophetic. They right. also need pastors to help them with their relational struggles. Totally. They need teachers to keep them doctrinally aligned. They need evangelists to keep them outwardly focused and to see the one. And, and they need apostles to give them a sense of purpose for the intel that they're seeing and to help it become missional and redemptive. And so I think that's how I would coach my younger self is just uh, to value what you're seeing, but to look for what other people are seeing and to listen to what others are hearing and then to work it into a symphony of context, a symphony of synergy that that creates a, a greater clarity and a greater impact. Now, can I just mention something on that? Because we were talking about the social social media prophets, you know, the self-proclaimed. And I, I mean, I can just hear people saying, well, I'm doing that. I'm on social media. I'm hearing all the words that are coming at me. And now it's less a symphony and maybe more like white noise because it seems <laughs> like everyone's doing it, right? Yeah. So just even learning like whose voice or like learning, obviously we learn to like recognize the Lord's voice in the different voices. But are you saying, listen to it? the full broadband, everything, or where, how would you narrow that down? I, I was really talking more about hearing, hearing God within the community. Um, as, as far That's as good. your own community, like uh, oftentimes you were sharing Haley, the story with Gabe. And I loved what Gabe shared with you, you know, mm -hmm. of, uh, he, he needed to know that you could see what he saw. And, and value what he saw and value what he's hearing um, to gain, uh, to gain uh, credibility even for the parts that you were seeing and the parts that you were hearing. And I think that patience, I think that commitment to EQ, not just SQ, is uh, super important in the development of the profit office in particular. Yeah. Chris, what about you? I'd love to hear what you would have told yourself 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. <laughs> 70, 80 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> what would you, the younger prophet 80 years ago, say to the older prophet? You know, what telegram would you have <laughs> sent yourself? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you know what I was thinking would be is an interesting question. I was, as you guys were answering the question I asked you, I, I had the question in my mind, what would the younger prophet say to the older prophet me? Mm. And I, I honestly Lately, that's been a bigger thing for me. Yeah. yeah. Because the younger prophet would have said to the older prophet, take a risk. The younger prophet would have said, nothing's impossible. Because the older prophet has seen many disappointments that the younger prophet didn't see. Wow. The, the older prophet, the younger prophet, didn't know that he could die. The older prophet right. has seen many die around me. The younger prophet had nothing to lose because he had no money, no notoriety, and no reputation. 
And the younger prophet would say to the older prophet, why not go back to the days when you were willing to risk it all? Why not go back to the days when you actually behaved as if nothing was impossible and it wasn't a scripture you read and a philosophy you believed, but a life that you led? The younger prophet would say to the older prophet, stand up in that plane when you get the unction and just mm-hmm. see how it goes. Right. <laughs> and the older prophet would say, well, the protocols of this plane are not such as to... <laughs> the younger prophet didn't... The younger prophet lived in the wilderness and didn't have 100,000 people in his congregation, so he didn't get tired of people where the older prophet lives overstimulated by a congregation that can't get enough. Right. Right. And it creates a sense of, I want to be isolated, where the younger prophet loved being in the congregation of people because he lived among a very small group of people. Mm -hmm. So I find the younger prophet talking to the older prophet a lot lately wow. and saying let's do it again you're going to die someday sooner now than you were 40 years ago and you older prophet will not be laying on your deathbed saying gosh I wish I would have taken less risks right right and the, young, the older prophet is more powerful, has more weapons, greater skills, more authority, and greater favor, but takes way less risk. Has the ability to touch 100x more than the young prophet, but rarely does. So I think that It's good for us to have a multi-generational movement in which the younger prophets among us are modeling what the older prophets used to walk in so that we can learn again the lessons we have forgotten. Mm. So So good. good. You know, as you were sharing, I I feel very moved because I think very seldom... You hear a man with such wisdom speak the way that you're speaking and um, with life still ahead of you, like so much still ahead of you. But I had an encounter with the Lord in the night. Two nights ago, I was half asleep, half awake, and the Lord started talking to me about the river of God. And he started saying to me that death isn't the fullness of death, that death is the absence of life. And he said, I am the river of life. And he and I saw the Lord grab a hold of people as they grabbed a hold of what they were called to. But there was almost this like passion, but a kind of a ferocity as people grabbed a hold. And um, I'm actually preaching on this on Sunday, I think, as the Lord gave us to me. But I feel like, Chris, your words right now are almost propelling people. I feel like even in in my youth, I felt like I always had reasons for why I shouldn't just go for it with everything. You know, I, I think I'm very zealous and I really do go after stuff, but there's still this measure of me. And I feel like the Lord is calling the people of God, the prophets, the, 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 the church to grab a hold of that, which he's entrusted us to and not seek for other things, but to obtain that which he's trusted us to and take a risk to invest it, not be like the one who hit it in the ground, but to take a risk. And I feel like your words are putting this momentum. I feel like there's people listening right now who you're like, you need to hear, like to grab a hold of that which God has given you as God grabs a hold of you. That's what I saw. I saw the Lord grabbing a hold of us. And I feel like he's going to take care of us, of all the things that we worry about. And we're going to grab a hold. And in Genesis 1, 17, it says, and this is how we bear the image of God. 
God is by being fruitful, multiplying and subduing the earth. And I feel like we need, like what you're saying is subdue that which is in front of you and multiply it with no fear. And um, I just prophesy that over whoever's watching, whoever's feeling this right now, like maybe the enemy's put a bridle in your mouth. There's been a limitation over your life. And maybe you think you're too old. Maybe you think that your season's done. And I feel like from Chris, there's this invitation to grab a hold of that which God has given you as God grabs a hold of you and springboards you into the fullness of the life that he's that he's made a way for it's so good <laughs> so good thank you god so That's good awesome. yeah i think that sometimes we know a lot and have a lot of experience and we need to go back to school to learn the things we've forgotten yeah Sometimes we've gotten really sophisticated and we've gotten, um, it, you know, we could be ever learning and never changing. Mm -hmm. And we can be, you know, uh, sometimes you can analyze life until you're paralyzed. Mm. You can know so much that you're, you can't move forward. And I, I think that sometimes not just about prophets, but about leaders and elders. You know, like everybody in this call probably, I've seen a lot. I've seen what can go wrong. And, you know, I'm surrounded by mostly a younger generation, which is beautiful. I'm so glad that I'm not just sitting, you know, with other elders talking about the way we were. But I think sometimes... In a prophetic community, it can be dominated by the people with the most experience and lose sight of the beauty of wonder. Mm -hmm. There was a guy named Michael Thompson that came to our church about, I don't know, it was a couple of years ago, probably now, and his message was entitled Wonder. And he was telling the story of a young boy, five or six, maybe seven years old, who had never been on a plane before. And his dad took him on a business trip. His dad regularly flew. And he set his young son next to the window. And as they and they were sitting in business class with a bunch of other people who had, you know, flew a lot. And as the they, you know, as they began to taxi for takeoff, you know, the young boy had his window open and he began to excitedly describe what he saw happening. Dad, look how fast we're going. Look how the trees, they just, they're just going by so quickly. And they, as they took off, Dad, look at, look at how everything looks like it's getting smaller and smaller. And for the next hour and a half or two hours, the young boy described what he was seeing out the window, which the old man had forgotten the wonder of flight. Mm -hmm. And he told the story that the boy's voice was loud enough in the front first class cabin that the other passengers who flew often also began to listen to the little boy, open their shades and look out the window and be reminded of the wonder of flight. And sometimes I think that the wonder of the office that the Lord has given us and the things that we are privileged to see mm -hmm. that others would long to see yeah. Yeah. is forgotten by how long we've ridden in business class. Mm. And the young prophets are so excited. <laughs> just to they, be on the plane. Just to be on the plane <laughs> and to look out the window. Yeah. yeah. And to remind us of what we used to be in wonder of. Thank you, God. 
It's, it's I, beautiful. Sitting with some uh, young prophetic people. I sit with them all the time, actually. <laughs> Uh, just in our community, on our team. And, you know, there had, someone was just sharing the other day, like, I called this guy out and I had his name. And and then I said, you have two daughters. And, you know, it was something like this. I, I, I probably am ad-living it from the information I remember, which probably isn't accurate, but it was like this. And I said, one of your daughters plays piano and the other's, a, you know, a, a ballerina. Some, it was, you know, these probably aren't accurate, but it was like information like that and they said yes and and i said well this is gonna you know this is happening and your wife is your wife an artist and yes my wife's an artist and and they were telling the story of the wonder of what it was like to get information right and then have the gift to accelerate that family into mm -hmm. god sees you god knows you and frankly, I, don't, I, I, I hope you can tell that this is in an arrogant way. That happens so much for me that I don't even tell my wife that I had that word today. Right. right. And it's not because I'm so spiritual. It's because it's become so usual. And I've lost the wonder of how amazing it is to see what other people don't get to see. And to use a gift like that, to walk away knowing that you just helped somebody, someone's entire family, see something about themselves that they never saw for themselves. And I think it's so important for the old prophets to be around the ones who are just moving up into business class, so to speak. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but in a way that says, the wonder of looking out the window again yeah. is pretty powerful. Right. The wonder of knowing that God has given you a special gift because he's just so wonderful and grateful and graceful should never be forgotten. And sometimes our gatherings, our school of the prophets, whatever we gather, but today we're talking about that, just leaves me remembering how it was when it all began. And I often think I learn more than I'm teaching. And I think that it's good to be in the presence of people who still wonder. And they don't have to be told what it means for signs and wonders to happen around them because they're still in wonder about mm -hmm. the signs that are happening through them. Yeah. So, guys, great interview. Super excited. August 7th through 11th, School of the Prophets. I think Dano and I, we've kind of figured out this is like our 20th year, but we missed like three in between. So I think this is our 17th School of the Prophets. Um, I guarantee you, you'll be in wonder. I guarantee you, you will be in the presence of people that you will leave encouraged. You will have an experience that you would have a hard time finding anywhere else in the world. And probably not the least of important, you will learn things and experience things that you never experienced before. And uh, I love our team. We flow together like a prophetic family. And uh, you can check us out at Bethel.com forward slash events. I think they're going to put it in the chat there anyway. Dano, Bethany, Haley, I love you guys. And I'm looking love forward. It's just like a month off. So... It's coming up fast. A month from today. Well, as of this filming. Yes, yeah. exactly. Of the filming. Woo. Love you guys. Love, Love you too. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks. Bye now. <laughs>